Welcome back, everyone. Hope you're caffeinated. Uh, we have a number of speakers to get through uh, for the last part of the day, um, all makers, all crafters. Uh, so we've got a lot of uh, quick changeovers happening. And so our first talk to get underway uh, is my friend Christopher Biggs, all the way from Brisbane. Uh, so Chris has been into open systems since the early 90s, was there at the birth of Linux and 386BSD. Um, these days, he's the principal of Accelerando Consulting, a boutique consultancy in Brisbane specializing in IoT, DevOps, mentorship, and cloud data. He's He's also building, I believe, a makerspace at the moment, so if you find yourself in Brisbane, uh, you should give him a shout. Um, he's also co-convener of the Brisbane IoT Interest Group and a founding executive member of Humbug, the Brisbane Open Systems User Group. And he, uh, if you follow him on Twitter, you know he, he builds cool things. He's raising some really cool geek children. And today he's going to talk to us about some of the projects he's done, uh, sketching and hardware uh, with the IoT. So please welcome Christopher. Thank you, Chris. So I've been involved with electronic gadgets since I was a teenager. Um, and until recently, and, and thank you, Chris and Jay, for this, I didn't really consider myself an artist. But I've, I've come to recognize that those of us in tech who work on software all day often feel a gap in our lives because we have no physical output from the hours of labor that we do. Um, in my day job, I founded a consultancy which helps businesses use technology to reduce stress. Um, and that's, that's, that's really what I, I strongly believe, that technology facilitates the gradual process of freeing humanity from drudgery and fear. And so I started Accelerando because I wanted to contribute to the kind of future that I can be excited to live in. And the aspects of, of building the world that I want to live in, that I want to tell you about today, are the Internet of Things, the things that I create to improve our homes and offices. And some of them are serious and practical, and some are less so. I think about, a lot about what kind of future I want to live in. On, on the left, we have, we have Star Trek, which says in the future that whenever we want to do anything, we have to poke at a screen or command a disembodied computer. T, Earl Grey, hot. In the Star Trek future, the computer becomes an unavoidable presence in our lives. Everything we do is mediated through it. On the right, we have a still from the 1984 production of, of Frank Herbert's novel, Dune, directed by David Lynch. It's a problematic book. It's widely regarded as a terrible movie. Nevertheless, it is a spectacularly beautiful film to look at. You could turn the sound down if you like. The, the world of Dune is a future where they had, they had their AI singularity and they decided that in fact they didn't much like it and chose another path. The household items of Dune are smart, some of them even hold conversations. But their interactions are tactile and subtle. This technology stays in the background. It literally becomes part of the furniture. And when it needs to attract our attention, it does so discreetly. And of course, form follows function. In Star Trek, everything is a rectangle. Devices make piercing beeps, and the computers all sound like they're vaguely annoyed at you. At least in the Next Generation series, they discovered how to apply the corner radius property to their rectangles. <laughs> and in Herbert and Lynch's vision, everything is elegant, deferential, and pleasant to hold. That, that's more the way I like it. I love this quote from artist and technologist Bran Ferrin, who is making the point that when things just work, we stop calling them technology. Nobody calls chairs technology, despite the amount of engineering and sophistication that goes into them, because they almost never go rogue for no visible reason. <laughs> rather unlike the Internet of Things. So I give you my three laws of IoT. Devices must cooperate for the benefit of humans. Devices must communicate and obey instructions. Devices must be as simple and reliable as possible. If you squint a bit, they look like Asimov's laws. That's not really profound, it's just me having a bit of fun. But Asimov got to retcon in a zeroth law, so I can too. Devices must be beautiful, or if they're not beautiful, invisible. We invite computers into our living rooms, our bedrooms, our bathrooms. They can't look like truck parts. So how do we do this? How do we arrive at beautiful objects that are also practical and well-behaved? Well, in the world of IoT prototypes, we often begin by treating these goals as separate concerns. At one time, we concentrate on how to solve the problem efficiently without any regard to aesthetics. At another time, we consider how we want the finished product to look and feel without being bothered for, to actually have to work. And you can do these steps in either order or at the same time. Uh, and of course, they influence each other to some degree. So you almost always go through multiple iterations. 
So it's been said that at Apple, and who knows how true this is, when they're designing a new product, they make 10 prototypes for every one that sees the light of day, and that they select the best two and then iterate further dozens of times over on, on those as they refine the design. It used to be that designers worked in pencil or clay or cardboard and would fiddle with an idea until they were confident enough to commission a prototype, but at, which could take months to build. Today, we've got 3D modeling software, we have desktop manufacturing, and we can create and learn from, and then discard, if, if desired, several prototypes in the course of a single day. So the technologies I'm gonna talk about today are laser cutting, computer milling, and 3D printing. The first two are relatively specialized, and um, I'll, I'll speak briefly about those. So a computer-controlled milling machine uses a high-speed spinning cutter to chop away material. If you've used a Dremel tool, you know, imagine handing it to a robot. Uh, you can use this tool to cut shapes out of sheet materials, but you can also sculpt in three dimensions. A laser cutter does the same thing, but it uses a laser, of course, and it really only works in two dimensions. And laser cutting allows you to make some very precise parts from plastic or wood or cardboard with, with minimal waste and noise. And the smoke and smell can be a problem, though. A couple of weeks ago, my, my daughter and I built an entire laptop computer from a kit, which came as a, a set of parts mostly made from laser-cut wood. And earlier today, um, Jay showed us what they're doing with laser-cut wood to complement their digital works. Now, I started my journey to rapid prototyping in that order. I got a small desktop milling machine, which let me make things from plastic and wood. Then I added a modest laser, which could cut out stickers and films. Um, I actually have a much more powerful laser waiting to be installed, but I haven't had a chance to set it up yet because I got a 3D printer and got distracted. So last year I got my th first 3D printer. Um, now I have four. I don't have a problem. <laughs> so today I think you can skip or outsource your milling and your laser cutting and, and do some, some, some really quite um, sophisticated creations with just a 3D printer. So in contrast to those subtractive processes that cut away material, 3D printing works by taking a roll of plastic that looks quite a lot like it came out of your, your garden lime, trim, lime, lime trimmer, and then it squeezes that plastic through a hot nozzle that melts it into a tiny filament. There's very little waste, not very noisy, the smells are minimal to non-existent. But unlike those other technologies, until recently 3D printing has been either rather expensive or maddeningly fiddly. But today I want to try to convince you that this technology is ready for you to try. So where are we in the journey of 3D printing from technology to furniture? It's 1985. You've been accepted to do a presentation at unix.conf.au, because Linux hasn't been invented yet, and you want to prepare a slide deck. Well, guess what, Sunshine? You need to prepare an actual deck of actual 35 millimeter photographic slides. You can't just write the slides on your laptop on the plane because laptops don't exist yet either. You needed to start a month ago and have a couple hundred bucks up your sleeve. If you don't have the time or budget, then maybe you have a flip chart and a marker pen or you handwrite overhead transparency films. Or maybe you need to prepare a report for your boss and you want it to look impressive. And in your office, you have this crappy dot matrix printer that looks uh, turns out printouts that look a lot like a cash register receipt. If you want something impressive, you have to go and butter up a typist to type it for you or schlep down to the mall to the print shop and pay them to print it. Moving along, it's the 90s. Well, now we have laser printers and they can even print on transparent films for our overhead projectors. But you wanted colour? Back to the mall. Today, you can run off a colour document on your office coffee and not even think about the cost. You can chuck it in a binding machine, um, and it looks pretty professional, if you hadn't typeset the whole thing in Comic Sans. <laughs> That's not font bashing, I actually like Comic Sans, but I wouldn't use it on a tombstone or an annual report. <laughs> so 3D printing is about at the 1990s laser printer stage of sophistication. It's good for many things, but not everything. So given you're in the 90s, you have to watch Baywatch reruns, why would you try 3D printing today? Well, firstly, because you're in a hurry. You want something, you're not prepared to wait for somebody else to go and build it. So here are some concrete examples. I got an Apple Watch um, as a gift quite a while ago, and 
One of the things that irks me about Apple is their design is so secret that there's never any accessories from third parties available. I wanted a dock so that I could put my watch next to my, my um, bed at night. Um, there were none, none to buy, but I, very, very shortly after, I could download a design and print my own. Um, just last week, uh, my wife got a new phone. The new headphones didn't fit in her headphone case. So we, we, we took an existing design, scaled it up, printed a new headphone case. Oh, got sick of all the, losing all the memory cards from my camera? Print a little drawer to keep them in. Um, maybe you broke something and you don't want to spend $2,000 on a new fridge. So if you've got an appliance or a, uh, a vehicle or a piece of machinery that's missing a part, you can print um, a new part. So here are the examples we have a fridge door, we have somebody lost the button off of their, um, their car remote unlocking you can replace those parts. My children love to antagonise each other by stealing each other's light switches, the, the little dimmer knobs um, for their lights and ceiling fans. So whenever, whenever they, uh, they have another round of that, I print off a batch of um, ceiling fan knobs and, and then they're back in business. Uh, my wife uh, works in a medical laboratory and they found that they were breaking their, their $1,000 pipettes, so we printed off a, a, a pipette stand from a design that we downloaded. In my office, I had these rather ugly looking shelves and I needed somewhere to put coffee cups, so I designed a solution that is appropriate just to me to, to hang those cups off of, off of the existing shelving brackets. But I want to tell you about a particular project as an example of my process. Many of us take a daily medication, including myself and, and several of my children, and some of us really struggle to remember to dose on time or at all. Now, there's a number of solutions out there for helping you to remember, but to my mind, they're all Star Trek solutions. You can get medication reminder apps, which will blare alarms at you, and you can get plastic medicine boxes with the day of the week printed on them, or even ones that have a little digital alarm clock in them. But these solutions all have one thing in common. They range from boringly utilitarian to, in the world's words of an old family expression, ugly as a hat full of assholes. <laughs> I wanted something pretty. So one of my kids has an attention deficit disorder. And when you ask an ADD kid if they remember to take their medication, the answer is usually, oh, I don't remember. So how do you motivate a child to do something? Video games. Why not make a medicine box that recreates a health pack from a video game? Oh, and the box is on the internet, so it can send you a reminder notification um, when you've forgotten to dose, and it knows when you last opened the box. Um, so if you, if you forget when you last dosed, it can tell you. And finally, to meet my lows of IoT, it's polite. If you remember to take your medication, it doesn't do anything. When you're up to date, it's got a little green light. When you should take a dose, it goes blue. When you're due to take it imminently, it goes orange. If you haven't taken it, it goes red. And then if you still don't um, come good by the time you're due to leave the house in the morning, it'll send you a polite text message. So let's begin with the simplest thing that could possibly work. I went to the craft store. I bought a $5 blank jewelry box. I downloaded a design for some 3D printed hinges. Uh, I couldn't find a latch that I liked, so I designed my own. I uploaded that to, to Thingiverse, and uh, all these designs that I talk about today will be uh, open sourced. Um, and then I put a tiny computer inside that can sense when the lid is opened. It uses Wi-Fi to connect to Amazon's Internet of Things framework. So we have a works-like prototype, a not particularly pretty looking box, tiny computer. Um, it proves the concept, but it isn't too pretty. But we can save this. My son's a gamer, so let's decorate the box to resemble a game item. So this is the, um, the med kit items from a game called Team Fortress. Um, and we need to, to match that design a white cross and a red circle. So this leads us into how to design in 3D. Appropriately for an art and tech talk, there's really two ways to go. If you're a coder like me, you can't go past a constructive geometry tool like OpenSCAD or SketchUp. These tools let you build complex designs by composing simple shapes using set operations like unions, intersections, and differences. And the advantage of working in this way is that you can adjust parameters and produce a final design which can easily be modified or remixed by others. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that you have to be a nerd. And this is why I think it's time for you to try 3D printing, because now you can do it in your web browser, even from your phone or tablet. 
This is Tinkercad from Autodesk, and it's, it's a whole lot of fun. So let's get cocky. My son got his video card upgraded, so now we can make a game item from Overwatch. The box itself uses the same kind of electronics from the, the earlier works-like prototype, but we get rid of the cord. I took a wireless charging kit for mobile phones, and I put the transmitter in the base and the receiver in the box. But how do we print that box? You can't print things that are in midair. So either you need to print a disposable support structure underneath those handles, or you need to break your design into parts. And, and I find snipping away those, those support structures to be a pain, so I decided to split up my design. So there's a great tool called Mesh Mixer that lets you cut your models up into parts. And if you're using OpenSCAD, then you can do similar kind of things by just subtracting a cube from the parts of your design that you don't want. And that's also a great technique for making test prints, which I learned from um, a Chinese maker called Naomi Wu. If you're experimenting with just one part of your project, like the handles, you can cut away the rest and just print that one part, and it saves you a heck of a lot of time. So this is my final design, which consists of the, the base unit containing the wireless transmitter um, and the box itself. And I printed a half-size version to bring along and, and to use as a prototype. And your options there in, ter in terms of, of printing in colour, you, you can get colour printers that can print in multiple colours. They tend to be expensive. What I do is I have a couple of smaller printers and I just swap filaments around a lot. So I print it in, in three or four different colours. Um, you can also paint 3D printed materials quite successfully. Um, an airbrush is an excellent tool. Um, and you really you have that option to either print something whole and then colour the individual parts or print the individual parts in different colours and assemble them later. Now, if you want to get a 3D printer, you can buy them in the supermarkets now. I, I bought, um, earlier this year, Aldi had a, a model in, um, earlier last year, Aldi had a model in, in their stores, which I bought one of, and, and I found it to be really quite excellent. Um, and not just excellent for the cost, really just rather reliable. Um, you can also get them from Officeworks, JCAR. If your budget's a little more limited, you can order online. Um, many of them come disassembled because uh, they're pretty large and, and shipping would be prohibitive. So if you're looking at getting into 3D printing, you're going to spend for a, for a kit that'll take you half a day to put together, and I'm talking just following instructions and screws. If you can assemble Lego, you can do this. Um, for something that can print um, 15 centimetres cube, um, around about 200 bucks, 20 centimetre cube, three or 400 bucks, um, bigger than that, uh, prices start to go up. So 400 millimetres, 500 millimetres, maybe up to, to 1,500 bucks. So how long does it take to print things? Well, it can be slow. If you're printing a new button for your trousers or a new knob for your fan, you're talking a, a handful of minutes. If you're talking um, a handle for your fridge, maybe a couple of hours. If you're talking this assembly here, um, in all its parts, that was four or five hours. The big pipette stand I showed earlier, that was the longest thing I've done. That took 11 hours. Is it fiddly? Sometimes, but it's <laughs> really quite, uh, quite rare to get that kind of disaster I've found. Um, I, I, I do do a, a whole presentation on, on the electronics, but I'm going to gloss over some of that today. But essentially, you can get these microcontroller modules that um, simply clip together. So if you're not up to speed with electronics, then you have a brain. If you want a switch, you plug a switch module on the top. If you want a temperature sensor, you plug a temperature sensor module on the top. If you want a light, you plug a light module on. So, um, and the, the software frameworks that you, you, you can use, um, you can program in JavaScript. Uh, practically anyone can program in JavaScript. Um, the operating system I'm recommending comes with um, a quite easy onboard process into Google's and Amazon's IoT, so you can hook into things that will send text messages or post to websites or monitor websites. It's really becoming um, excitingly easy to build unique objects 
that uh, enrich your life in interesting ways. So um, I do want to leave some time for questions. So to, to briefly recap, um, the, the key thing for me about uh, rapid manufacturing technologies and, in, and 3D printing in particular is it's technology that serves you, not the market. If you want something that nobody else wants, this is the way for you to get it. Um, we are at a, the very much the dawn of, of consumer usability of this technology, where, where sort of 1990s laser printer is my analogy. Um, and you can choose um, a good, solid, well-supported, but a little bit more expensive printer, or you can go to the bare bones um, Chinese imports. Most of those are good. There are some shockers. And if you're interested, I can help you find which ones are the good ones to go with and which ones are the shockers. If you're in Brisbane, um, the Internet of Things meetup is running uh, an event in February to build your own printer for a day. So we come into uh, our makerspace and assemble and then learn how to use. Um, and if uh, enough of you uh, grab me by the shoulders and say, take it on the road, uh, uh, that's, that's a possibility. So, uh, thank you for your time today, and I am happy to take questions, and, and we'll be here all week, um, and over to you. And last slide, uh, some resources in the slide deck, um, which will be up on my website soon, with URLs for most of the, the um, products I've talked about. Well, thank, thank you. So, while that's happening, I'll get the next speaker to start setting up, and then oh, yeah. we'll do a few questions. Oh, where's that girl? Just um, using computer game, sorry, right here. Ah, probably, using computer game resources uh, is an excellent way to connect with children and mm -hmm. younger people who um, really have that as a self-identifier. When it comes to uh, accessing these resources, do you uh, sculpt them from scratch or do you try to like, dig into the computer game software to access um, the game models? I essentially eyeballed that some screenshots and and uh, created the design from from scratch. Any more questions? Where's the um, where's the gadget? Please. Oh. Uh, nope. uh, do you have any non-JavaScript frameworks for building IoT devices? Yes, Mongoose OS, which is the one I talked about. Um, you can also program in C. Um, the Node MCU framework you can program in um, Lua, and you can also run the Arduino framework on these same devices which you're programming in C++. So if, if JavaScript is not your thing, there's plenty of options. And MicroPython uh, runs on all these platforms as well. Join me again in thanking Chris, please.